Happy New Year, folks. Well, here we are, the first, first Sunday in 2024. I hope that your Christmas season was blessed of God. Hope you had a chance to visit family and friends, maybe even give a gift or get a gift, have some of that dessert and those cookies. And hopefully we'll be able to take off those extra few pounds here in the next week or two or three, maybe by the end of January. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm looking forward to all that God has for us and for, you, for us this year and excited to see him working in your life and in my life and the life of our family and friends and in, in the world around us as well. And uh, since this is the first message that I have for you uh, uh, in the new year, I hope it will also be an encouraging one for you. You know, as we move into this new year, um, I'm thinking of many of the athletes from around the world who, who will have their eyes on the upcoming Summer Olympics. This year, the 2024 Summer Olympics will be held in Paris, France from July 26 to August the 11th. And I just want to share a little bit of history about that. Uh, Paris uh, will become this year the second city after London to host the Summer Olympics for the third time. The first time Paris held the Olympics was 1900. And then the last time was 100 years ago this year, 1924. Another tidbit of information I want to share with you is Paris 2024 will feature the introduction of breaking as an Olympic event. And if you wonder what breaking is, some of you probably know what I'm talking about. It's commonly known break dan as breakdancing. On what I think is a, a more serious note, Paris 2020, pardon me, Paris 2024 is expected to cost a whopping 8.3 billion euros. And for us Canadians, that works out to about $12 billion for the 16-day event. But mostly, uh, Paris 2024 had me thinking about the athletes themselves, those that will be competing this summer, and the amount of dedication and training that is required to become an Olympian. Well, I did a little bit of searching online. I came across a website called wikihow.com. You might have heard of it. And it was very convenient for it provided really there for me a step-by-step -step guide into the process, a process one would need to become an Olympian. Now, of course, I, I don't have the time to share all those details, but I do want to mention briefly uh, the, the commitment it would take for the, the training commitment it would take to become an Olympian. And the, so the prospective athlete would begin their training in really the very early years of life, the preteen years of life, where one would be expected to train uh, in their chosen discipline, at least according to wiki, wikihow.com, uh, 250 hours a year, or maybe it's six months. Then moving from preteen to the teen years, uh, between competing and training, uh, this uh, expectation will go up to about 600 hours a year. And if one actually makes an Olympic team, well, the, the training takes on a whole new dimension and one could be expected to train 1,100 hours or possibly we'll put it into months, 11 months out of the whole year. Indeed, my friends, if one hopes to become an Olympian, it would take a great deal of amount of dedication and training and resolve really a setting aside of normal participation in everyday life in order to compete as an Olympian. Well, the, this uh, day we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, so please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Um, I would recommend that when you have time later is to read Hebrews chapter 12, but also the chapter before and the chapter after for your own uh, edification. But we'll, we'll be just focusing on the first four verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners 
such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you uh, for this first Sunday in the new year. We commit this year unto you, O Lord. May you be glorified in it uh, and in our, through our lives and what we think and what we say and what we do. And may you help us today by your spirit to illuminate this text, to move us and change us and form us and shape us to be like your son Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, today we're, we're coming to the end of the very first week of 2024 and beginning the second week. And as this new year lies before each one of us, um, I want to ask uh, some questions, ask you some questions. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to continue your walk, your journey with God into 2024? Or maybe you're still back there somewhere. Uh, you're physically present, watching and listening to this video. But emotionally, spiritually, you're still back there somewhere. Maybe you are present fully, but you're somewhat banged up, somewhat beat up. 2023 kind of beat you up a bit. Maybe you're indifferent today. Maybe you're checked out at this moment in your life. More, maybe you are hopeful and looking forward to the year ahead. My friends, whatever state you are in, whatever condition you are in, whatever happened back there in 2023, whatever you hope for this year, we all need some refocusing. We all need some encouragement as we move forward into this new year. I asked you a moment ago, uh, are you ready to continue to walk with God in 2024? Now, there's a much better metaphor that's been provided for us here in the very text we're looking at today. And we see this in verse 1, where we read, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, John Bloom, who is a staff writer for DesiringGod.org, in his article called Embrace the Race God Gives You, put it this way, quote, will you embrace your race? So that's the question of the day. Will you embrace your race this new year? It's the metaphor we're using. And as we turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and our focus will be the expo exposition, of course, of the first four verses of our text, we don't isolate these four verses from the context so keeping with the good habits of Bible study, let's consider a few of the background items concerning the letters of the Hebrews that will help us have a foundation to work with. And let's start with one of the most important characteristics of this letter, and that is the writer's emphasis, and you will see this if you know this letter, and you should look at this letter in depth, you'll see the emphasis on the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial system. And besides understanding that a familiarity with the Old Testament book of Leviticus would be very helpful, we do have an important clue here. At the time of the writing of this letter, this Levitical emphasis in the letter suggests that the priesthood and the sacrificial system were still in operation at its writing. Keep that in mind. Second important item is the absence of any reference to the Gentiles. Now, we shouldn't think or suppose that the Gentiles were to be excluded. That would not be the case. But however, the writer of Hebrews was writing primarily to a community of Hebrews. And a community of Hebrews, as MacArthur in his commentary would suggest, that some were Christians, faithful Christian believers. Some were convinced intellectually regarding the claims of Christ and had yet to make that leap of faith. And also, there were some unbelievers who were attracted to the claims of Christ. Well, one final item, and seemingly the motivation for the letter, the context of the letter reveals a community of Jewish Christians facing the possibility of increasing persecution or looming persecution. We go to chapter 10, verse 32 to 39, and there the writer reminds his audience of their former days. The former days when these Jews had placed their faith and trust in God, and how at that time, according to the writer here in verse 32 of chapter 10, had endured a hard struggle with suffering. 
which included, even in detail here, the plundering of their property, uh, verse 34 of chapter 10. And how did they endure, the, and, and yet, pardon me, and yet they, even, they endured it at the time. Why? Well, according to the writer here, they knew they had a better possession, possession and an abiding one, chapter 10, verse 35, and that would, of course, be Christ himself. And now because of the looming persecution with the potential that some might be tempted to forsake Christ, the writer desired to encourage the Jewish Christians and motivate them into action and he gives them some warnings. For example, he warns against drifting from the faith, drifting from the faith once received. We see this in chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. He also warns them against unbelief. Pretty serious thing. And we see this in chapter 3, verse 7 to 14. He warns them against relapsing from the teachings concerning Christ, possibly back to Judaism. We, sign, we find this in chapter 5, beginning in verse 11, all the way through to chapter 6, verse 20. He also warns them against despising the truth and listening to other things. Chapter 10, verse 26 to 39. And here in chapter 12, he warns them against departing from Christ altogether. Chapter 12, verse 25 to 29. Well, there's more, but I think we've built a decent foundation to work with. And as we begin to dig a little deeper, we are reminded of the challenge that is before us in this new year. Will we embrace the race, as Mr. Bloom suggested? Will we stay the course in 2024? What possibly could be hindering us from running freely and with joy? And these and other questions like them are important to ask because if you are a follower of Christ, you have a race to run. You have a race to run. And it's a race that has been given to you by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Theologian and pastor John Stott once said about the Christian life, quote, do not be content with a static Christian life. Determine rather to grow in faith and love in the knowledge and holiness, end quote. Now, I wonder, when I read this, I wondered if Estad had in mind the letter to the Hebrews uh, when he said what he said. I wonder, wonder that because the, Hebrew, the writer of the Hebrews in verse 14 of the 12th chapter said this, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. My friends, indeed, the Christian life is a marathon. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint, nor was it ever intended to be static. It was never intended for us to be sitting on our duffs. Pardon the expression. Notice with me with verse 1 then. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, if we ask the, gener the, the common questions, who are these witnesses and, and why should we notice them? Well, back to verse 1. At the very beginning, we see this conjunction called, uh, called this conjunction Therefore, so we ask, why is it therefore? Well, it's therefore so that we bring with us what the writer had previously said into this particular thought. In this case, the writer had in mind the faithful heroes of the faith of chapter 11. That's the heroes of faith that we see there. There's about 18 of them. And he even commends them for their faith, chapter 11, verse 39. But it's an interesting Greek word here. Uh, and it's translated in the English here, cloud. When we see what the word here means, it's used really in a metaphorical sense and means a dense multitude. So it's no stretch then to consider that the writer had more than just this list of faithful in the 11th chapter in mind. And my friends, this is really why we should pay attention to these witnesses. The witnesses that we find throughout scripture actually of their faith in God. Because if you and I want to run the, with endurance the race that is set before us, if you and I want to run well, freely and joyfully, we will study and we will learn from other runners who have gone before us. And Hebrews really gives us a place to start, if we have never done this before, with a list of faithful runners in the 11th chapter, which I would recommend to you to read. And there, you can go from there to other places in the Bible. And then, of course, we could talk about those that have preceded us 
or are now running a race in our context too, but we don't have the time today. But keeping all this in mind, that your race, first of all, is yours to run, yet, despite that, all the experiences and the challenges that you have, a lot of them are common to all people in all of human history. The Apostle Paul put it this way in his first letter to the church at Corinth. He said, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, that is not common to mankind. And he went on to say that God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with a temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, yes, there's a lot of things that are common to all people at all points in history, but to the faithful ones of God, to God, he has provided a way through a lot of those challenges. With this in mind, the writer now exhorted his readers to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Verse 1. Now this is a very interesting statement. We know that the writer was encouraging endurance. Endurance. And one of the obstacles to running with endurance, he puts right here, was the weight and sin which clings so closely. I want us to notice first the writer's reference to weight. What is this weight that would hinder the Jewish Christians from running their race freely? Remember when we began, we discovered that one of the characteristics of this letter to the Hebrews is the emphasis of the Levitical priesthood and sacrificial system? And of course, in this letter, if you were to read through it, and, and you probably know this if you have read through it, he is contrasting this to Jesus Christ, who is the one and only high priest, and also the once for all perfect sacrifice for all of sin. Yes, indeed, Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king of heaven. Yet, as we know from Paul's letter to the Galatians, that there was great effort in those early days of the church from the Jewish community and even persecution from the Jewish community toward Jewish Christians. Some had insisted on keeping many of the pieces of the Levitical system along with the gospel for salvation, which Paul was adamant in his letter to the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 6, was a different gospel. And my friends, Paul would go even further and say this, that, that if he or even an angel from heaven itself would preach a gospel that was different than what the apostles had preached, let him be cursed. Galatians 1.8. So what is this weight that the writer is addressing to his audience? Well, in their context, it is the weight of the Levitical system with its legalism. When we think about the first century athletes, especially the runners, they would lay aside, they would put off any items of clothing that would hinder their performance. So the writer here is exhorting his audience to lay aside every weight. In other words, to put off or aside anything except Christ. And this is no different in our context, in your life and in my life. We want to run as light as possible. God wants to free us to run the race that he has given us to run. So let's lay aside every weight, any kind of hindrance, whatever that might be. And also let, let's lay aside the sin which clings so closely. Remember, my friends, that the cross has paid for your sin once for all. This is what the Hebrews, the writers of the Hebrews would say. His sacrifice was once for all. Let's lay aside those things. Let's lay aside any ideas of doing this life my way or the highway. Let's lay aside the culture's ways and means of doing life. Let's lay aside our sinful past. Let's lay aside our regrets and our fanciful idealism, our pie-in-the-sky wishes and, and dreams which only distract us and slow us down and bog us down. And my friends, when the race gets difficult, and it will get difficult, and if you haven't experienced that yet, well, you will. Remember that God promised that these present trials and sufferings that we endure, as he promised those early Christians, they were light and momentary affliction. And not only that, that these light and momentary afflictions were preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, that is temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That's Paul writing his second letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 17 and 18. So 
So one, learn from faithful runners. Two, run as light as possible. Next, notice with me, let us run with endurance that race that is set before us. Verse 1. So let's talk about endurance. When we think about the Olympic athletes, endurance and their chosen discipline is essential. And the thing about athletes, endurance is not only essential, it is measurable. For example, the professional hockey player needs to have endurance for what? Three periods of hockey. Those competing at Paris 2024 in the 100 meter race need to have endurance for let's say about 10 seconds. The marathoner, the marathon runner will need to have endurance to finish the 26.2 miles, let alone finish in the top 10. In my experience in the years I spent in the military, endurance also was essential, except it was measured differently. It could mean months and months away from the family and friends and even from the country and so much more. But when we look at the New, Text, New Testament context, endurance uh, of those folks that we see here in the New Testament was the characteristic of a person who was not swayed in their deliberate purposes in Christ. This was a person who was not swayed from their faithfulness uh, to faith and righteousness, even in the greatest trials and sufferings. And here's the other thing. The race that Christ has given to each one of us is lifelong. And the endurance we need to run lifelong needs to be developed. So we now have to ask the question, how do we develop this? How, you, how do we do this, you might ask? Well, there's no easy way for me to say this. How does Christian, the Christian, how do you develop uh, endurance? Well, my friends, it's by trials and tribulation, by suffering. That's the way the New Testament provides. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Roman church, put it this way. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 4 to 6. My friends, the race that you have been given isn't about grinning and, and bearing it all. It's not, about, it's not pulling up our bootstraps and setting our noses to the grindstone. Because if this is how you understand endurance, according to the word of God, you won't make it to the end of January. Maybe not even to the end of next week. We develop endurance when we persevere through our trials and sufferings. And when we are in those moments of trials and tribulations, it's our Father in heaven who gives us the gift of endurance in the midst of the trial. If we had the time, we, could, we would discover here in chapter 12 that the way God delivers uh, on his province of endurance sometimes is often in the seasons of discipline from him. The Hebrews chapter 12, for example, verse 11 says this, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. We learn endurance, we gain endurance when we push ourselves, when we carry on every day by faith, when we're in the midst of those trials and tribulations. So friends, one, learn from faithful runners. Two, run as light as possible. Three, run with endurance. And now we have four, keep your eye on the prize. Verse two, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, the Apostle Paul, knowing that soon he would be executed, said this to his dear friend Timothy, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. So the question is, how did Paul do it? How did he finish his race? Well, friends, he kept his eye on the prize, Jesus. This is what the writer of the Hebrews was saying to his audience. Look to Jesus. This is what the word of God is saying to you and me today. Jesus is your example. Jesus is your joy. Jesus is your greatest prize. Well, I have to ask another question or two. At the beginning of a new year, do you feel unmotivated to run your race? 
Has Jesus become hidden somehow? Has Jesus has Jesus taken has Jesus <laughs> can't even say his name? Has Jesus taken second place in your life? You know, there's this old bumper sticker that used to be around. It says, Jesus is my co-pilot. Wrong, my friends. That's so wrong. Jesus doesn't take the second seat. He's nobody's co-pilot. He's the pilot. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings, my friends. He's the prize at the end of the race. And it's Jesus who gives you the endurance, the strength needed to run your race every day in, every day in and out. My friends, Jesus is the way maker. He's the promise keeper and the light in the darkness. When you grow weary and faint hearted, look to Jesus. You know why? He is the one who endured hostility for sinners like us, who endured the cross, and today is seated at the right hand of the God, interceding for you every day. And my friends, the day will come that you can say with the Apostle Paul, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Well, friends, here it is. One, learn from faithful runners. Two, run as light as possible. Three, run with endurance. And four, keep your eye on the prize. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this new year. And I pray for those folks that are listening or watching or both. God, that you would give them the endurance they needed just for one day at a time. And Lord, they would trust you with their lives. They would depend on you. They would seek you every day. And they would read your word and they would understand the way forward in this new year. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Well, again, folks, Happy New Year. All the very best. Shalom.